Good morning, Church of the Brethren, here at Middlebury. Welcome all those that are here and those that are the six that are online, Mark uh, says, so uh, welcome all. We had a uh, fantastic week of warm weather, being lulled into a sense of, boy, this is the way it's going to be, and we know better. <laughs> so, but anyway, enjoy it while we can, right? Several announcements. Uh, March 16th has been talked about several times, but March 16th is the um, district's women's retreat. Uh, registrations due uh, later this month, so for those ladies that want to attend that, and I'm sure it'll be a, an, a good session, uh, please do so. Uh, checks payable again to MCOB, and we'll send one check to the district then. I uh, also read the, with a great deal of, of uh, joy the um, partnership that Little Lights had with the families to raise funds for Heifer International. Uh, raised $310.92, and uh, that, uh, what a fantastic uh, uh, effort with, uh, with the kids and their parents. Uh, that money will purchase one water buffalo and three flocks of chicks. So there you go. Very nice. Uh, our pastor's moving, as you know. Uh, it happens next week. Uh, help is needed Friday and Saturday, so if you can do that, please uh, text Kurt because he's keeping track of all that and will be, uh, when, once he knows more specific times, be communicating with people as to when to show up and, and those kinds of issues when the trucks arrive in Middlebury. So if you can help, please uh, do so. And Renee has a little more uh, to add to that um, event. So on Saturday, we're going to be doing a lunch for all the movers, and it will be here at the church. Uh, Goshen City is going to be bringing hamburger and buns and uh, the fixings for a Sloppy Joe's. And what we need is we need vegetable trays and uh, potato chips. They're also bringing desserts. So, um, there, so we will be setting up here. I will be at the church at 1030. If you could let me know... Uh, what you can contribute, I would appreciate that. I'll be here at 1030 to get it set up for noon so that people can kind of come. We're, we're kind of thinking to do like more of the finger food kinds of things because I think that people will be eating and going back to moving is what I'm anticipating. Um, and so we don't want uh, a big, huge sit down thing of, of time constraint. We want to be able to feed people and then move into... Um, are, are continued of getting the pastor moved. The very exciting time. And um, thank you to the uh, Goshen City for helping to work with us. Thank you. Um, I want to add to that, folks, that uh, on, on that day at 1 o'clock, uh, we'll have a Project Promise practice going on here. So you're likely to see a lot of the, the, the participants kind of wandering around. Uh, just just want to let everybody know that. Yeah, thank you, Mark. So it's going to be a busy weekend. That's good. So we need your help again. Today is birthday Sunday. Those in February include uh, Braden Copeland on the 9th, Maxine Harvey on the 11th, Dalton Showalder on the 14th, Riley Rudd on the 24th, and on February 19th. We have someone entering the, a new decade. His 90th birthday will be Mr. Bill Hawkins. Uh, so, yeah. So, um, I don't think he looks a day over 60, 60 maybe, something like that. So, anyway, uh, we're happy for that, Bill. So, let's sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Are there any other announcements? Fresh Wednesday. Fresh Wednesday. 
Thank you. We have been invited. Yeah, Kurt reminds me that uh, we have been invited to Goshen City's Ash Wednesday uh, service uh, this Wednesday on the 14th at 6.30 p.m. with a fellowship time that will follow. So uh, the service itself will last approximately half hour and then there will be a fellowship time. So thank you for that reminder. And um, if you can make it over to Goshen City. Anything else? I'm gonna do that later. All right, let's, um, let's now enter into the prelude. Thank you, Lori. The call to worship is contained in your bulletin. I'm the leader, you're the people. Day after day, week after week, year after year, it seems that nothing really changes. The same attitudes prevail, the same conflicts continue, the same systems define our lives. We claim to hope for something new and fresh. In our worship today, may we truly seek God. May we seek the God who refreshes the creation, who offers to reset our perspectives, who can truly make all things new. Let's pray. Our Father, as we uh, come to you today in this service, help us to be open to newness, to freshness, to new things, a different way. We've worked very hard at that the last several months as we work with our friends at Goshen to conduct uh, uh, services in a different way. And it has worked well and we thank you for that. But there are many other ways that we can be open to newness and just help us. We appreciate this opportunity this morning to come together to silent our minds and just calm Calmly listen to what you will bring to us. Amen. So let's now stand as you're able, and our first hymn is number six here in this place.
Please be seated. As is always the case, our offering plate is in the back of the room. Uh, Steve, hold on a minute. I've got a few things before I'm going to ask you to come forward. You know, again, sometimes we take this time for granted. It's what we do. It's, uh, it's our responsibility to give back to, to the Lord that, that is ours, but is ultimately his. But I want to talk a little bit about what happened in 2023 due to your faithfulness. You know, we, um, we had pledges for, uh, in 2023 of just a little over $65,000. You actually gave almost $90,000. Amen is right. I mean, what a difference. That's to the general fund. To the building fund, uh, pledged was $23,080. Given was $23,140. So it was what? $60 over what was pledged. So that was even, you know, it's better than being behind. So again, thank you. We've got our mortgage balance down to $405,000. That's still a lot of money to be certain, but when you consider some years ago, you know, it was five, six, seven hundred thousand, and so we're whittling away at that. We have $60,000 in our checking account right now. Um, that's good. And just again as a reminder, our little ones, our little lights operation generated revenue in 2023 of uh, almost $563,000, almost a half million dollars. And that operation contributed $60,000 back to the church um, to help us pay bills, to help us do things. They write a check for $5,000, well, they don't write a check, it's transferred, but $5,000 every month back to um, the church. So that's faithfulness in action. Um, that's, that's real time stuff. And thank you for your, um, for your faithfulness. Uh, I have another little thing to report that we included in our 2024 budget. Uh, and that was, we had a thousand dollars allocated to our pastor search. Uh, and we didn't know what those expenses may be. But we thought it would be prudent just to put uh, those monies in there. So um, leadership team decided that it would be prudent, well, more than prudent, it would be fun to expend those dollars because they're there for, for our new pastor. So, Kurt, I, we have a check for you for 1000 bucks to help you move. So, um, so another evidence of... of uh, uh, the, there's a U-Haul truck right there, so that, that's helped. So, so again, due to your willing to share your resources, uh, we can help the Borgmans move. Um, so we're happy to help with that. So there you go. So now, Steve, please bring... <laughs> Our Father, we are just so grateful for the gifts that you have given us. And the reminder that those gifts are temporary and we have a responsibility to return those back. Back to um, various people that, that, that need it, organizations that need the help. Uh, there's so, so many to name. But um, we, we give those resources joy, joyfully, uh, knowing that uh, they are put to good use and that... Um, we use your gifts in, in, a, in a good way. So thank you for, for that ability. Thank you for the uh, unselfishness that this congregation continues to show. And, uh, and, we, uh, and we are blessed for that uh, unselfishness. Thank you. In your most holy name we pray. Amen. Pastor Kurt will now uh, bring our joys and concerns. You are kind and generous people. Thank you. 
As we move into this time of sharing, um, I'd ask that before you share your joy or concern, you'd wait for the microphone and also uh, identify yourself by name. What do you have to share for prayer today? Um, again, it's done. We received a text early this morning from Jill Weaver, and I'll read. Kathy and Lucy are living with us. We all know that. Uh, Kathy has just suffered a seizure. She is conscious, and we're waiting for the EMT squad. And that was um, about two hours ago. So if we could be in prayer for all of them, that, that would be appreciated. Certainly. I'm in the process of <clears throat> strengthening my heart situation. It's a real learning experience as to where our technology is this day. Some weeks back, I blanked out, and when I woke up, our team from the town had been there to offer first aid and take me to Goshen if necessary. After talking a little bit, thanks to Beth, who's got skill and knowledge that I don't have, said thank you to them, and we uh, now have had a, 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 an encounter with the doctors. It's amazing as to how that has changed over my lifetime here from my first encounter with doctors. They went up my blood vessel and hunted around and told me a lot of things I needed. And I said, I'm uh, ready to move to phase two. But to have the technology and the experience that by one very small entry, they can go up and tell me a lot about my heart and what will take to improve it. And I just say thank you to the world and the level of, uh, of uh, development and such. So in a week or so now, they've been in, looked around, know exactly what they're doing with. We'll be prepared now to go have another uh, mar marvelous, you know, seeing you think your blood vessel are going to go up and make a correction in your heart and all that while I sleep. And then I wake up and go home. It's a miracle in operation. And I thank all the support and affirmation I get from you folks to keep on keeping on. Yes. Hi, Lori Copeland here. I'm going to speak on behalf of Britta this morning. Um, thank you to everyone who brought in blankets for the blanket drive for foster children. Uh, her goal was 12, and last count, I think there was 16, and I see that there's four or five more added this morning, so thank you very much. And the other is a concern. They have court for the kids on Wednesday, on Valentine's Day. Um, our hearts are just heavy waiting for that. So please just keep the whole family in your prayers. Yes. We have, uh, we have two in online folks. Uh, first off, we have seven people watching, but have a request from Bethany. Bethany says, my daughter's friend, Katie, was just diagnosed with cancer. She is only 16. I ask for prayers for Katie and her friends and family. And there is a second request from Bethany. A friend of mine is having continuing issues with a chronic condition. 
it has really been a drain on her physically and emotionally. Her name is Courtney. Okay. Andrew's back here. Um, some of you know from Facebook that I had a PET scan last week, and um, by Friday I got word that um, ne neither of my cancers have recurred. And so that, that was a real joy to hear that. I'm can still cancer-free. I'm still in a maintenance um, program that I will probably be in for at least another year. But at this point, it's working, and I'm just so grateful and thankful. We are grateful, too. Boys are speaking this morning. Yesterday, I saw Bernard Ball, and this is his news, joys and concerns. This week, he, he and June are attending church at Pine Creek Church of the Brethren, his old church. He wanted to say hello. Further, he reached out to Cleveland Clinic recently, and they have reached out back to him, and he will be going there for tests and treatment. On March 26th, he'll be having a CAT scan. In April, Bernard and June will be going to Arizona to visit his children, which they just love to do. And lastly, I would say, since the day I first met Bernard, I've never seen a man in such good spirits for the troubles he's had. So that is a true joy. Amen. I have uh, one more thing to share. Um, those of you who are on Newsline may be aware of this, but uh, I wanted others to know. Um, we received news this week that the Church of the Brethren congregations in Puerto Rico have withdrawn from uh, the Church of the Brethren to join the Covenant Brethren Church. There are six congregations. And that process um, decision was made without engagement with denominational leaders of the Church of the Brethren. So that was disappointing and I would say even a, a bit hurtful. Um, the Church of the Brethren has been present in Puerto Rico since 1942 when um, a, a, a CPS um, camp was established in Castaner and that led to a collaboration between the church and the government that included a building of a hospital in Castaner and that was the beginning of the Church of the Brethren there. And the Church of the Brethren in Puerto Rico has birthed other um, expressions of the Church of the Brethren in the Dominican Republic, um, which also led to, to Church of the Brethren presence in Haiti and so on. So it's really a, a long, rich history and feels like a rather abrupt um, turn in a new direction. So um, I'd invite your prayers for uh, the Church of the Brethren at large, uh, for our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico, uh, for leaders in the church that are dealing with kind of this process um, and just, uh, you know, prayers of grieving for uh, another um, turn in relationship in, in the denomination. Are there any others? Let us join our hearts in prayer. <clears throat> O oh God of new life, we are reluctant to give up our old lives. We confess that we can't help but wonder where we will end up if we yield to change. If we have to lay down what we have carried for so long, if we release what we've held close and held dear. Faced with giving over what we have known and owned, we are scared to think of ourselves as without. And we trust, O oh God, that you understand our anxiety because you brought us into this world as completely vulnerable little humans, completely dependent, completely unable to do or control anything. And you understand that as we gained a little control and a little more, we would be reluctant to go back to dependence. So we confess that we have trust issues you are trustworthy, O oh God, we know that, but we still have trust issues. Will you catch us when we fall, 
Heal us when we are wounded. Save us when we are in danger. Comfort us when we are hurting. Love us when we are so far from being lovable. O oh God, we bring to you all our needs, our concerns, our sadness, our wounds. We bring all these things to you in prayer, and still we struggle to trust because we know in our bones that things will not stay the same. We are still not in control. We are still dependent, and we don't like it. We don't trust it. But receive, we pray, all the things we have offered for prayer today. Receive all these things that concern us and test us and stretch us, and make us feel weak and worried. Receive all these things and then receive us as well. Our tender spots, our tears cried for those we love, our sadness at tears in the fabric of the church, our physical struggles and limits, our yearnings that seem to remain unfulfilled, our horror at what is happening in the world, our imminent transitions and our uncertainties about whether everything will work out and how everything will get done. Strengthen us, O God, not to do it all ourselves, but to be willing to share our needs with others and to rely on the help of others. Strengthen us to seek reconciliation and to commit to kindness. We know change is upon us, O God, but let us neither be intimidated by how bright change can be, nor confused by how cloud-covered it might become. Let us hear your voice of acceptance and affirmation and approval that we might know that we are your beloved ones, just as Jesus, the one in whose name we pray, was your beloved one as well. Amen. I failed to mention when I was talking about the um, 2023 results that if anybody wants a copy of the year-end reports, Laurie will be happy to to give you one if you want to see the specifics. All right, our scripture reading, God's word will be coming to us first from 2 Kings 2, 1 to 12. That's contained um, on page 332 in the Old Testament in the Pew Bibles. And you need to pay attention between Elijah and Elisha. (laughs) All right. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, 
a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Please turn to him, number 517, open my eyes that I may see. Continuing with the New uh, Testament scripture, be Mark 9, 2 to 9, uh, page 44 in the uh, New Testament section of your Pew Bible. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. These are the words of God. (laughs) 
Transfiguration Sunday comes around every year at this time since it's the bridge Sunday between the season of Epiphany and the season of Lent, which begins this coming week. Comes around every year at this time and given the name Transfiguration, it is not surprising to us that it always features a story of Jesus being transfigured on the mountaintop, changed from his normal human appearance into a bright and dazzling supernatural figure. Along with the Jesus transfiguration story from one of the Gospels, the lectionary each year on this Sunday also features a selection from the Hebrew Scriptures, of course. That selection is sometimes this morning's story about Elijah and Elisha, and sometimes it's a story of Moses on the mountaintop with God. And in one case, on the third year of the three-year cycle, lectionary cycle, the story is about how Moses' actual face was changed, transfigured, by being in the presence of God. This morning's Elijah and Elisha story, while not featuring a change quite like the change that Moses experiences, is an interesting change story nevertheless. It could be read as quite literally a passing of the mantle story with the master, or we might use the word mentor, coming to that point in the shared journey with his student where the student now has to take ownership and responsibility of the work that is ahead, but the student is not quite sure he is ready. The master, Elijah, keeps telling the student, Elisha, that he is to stay behind while Elijah goes on, and Elisha keeps refusing. Each time Elijah heads to the next place, Elisha comes along. So they go to Gilgal, and from there they go to Bethel, and from there to Jericho, and from there to the Jordan River, finally crossing over the Jordan. And then, after having crossed the Jordan, it is time for the parting. And suddenly, a heaven-sent chariot of fire and horses of fire appear, and Elijah is taken up into heaven in a whirlwind. It is a wondrous and overwhelming supernatural moment. Elisha is amazed, and he is grief-stricken. This person, this mentor that he's counted on the most is gone, taken away in fire and wind. It all changes right before his very eyes. You remember the old spiritual, swing low, sweet chariot, right? Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home, a band of angels coming after me coming for to carry me home. That song sounds notes of weary comfort. God is coming to take us home. The melody is rhythmic and haunting. But the truth of the context of that spiritual is that for those slaves who sang that song, the homecoming, as it were, was anything but comforting at least in any easy way. That transition was hard. They sang of release from this world because this world was so brutal and horrific for them. And in the Elijah-Elisha story, the world is difficult too. The crossing over is anything but slow and steady. It's a whirlwind moment. It's a transforming, a transfiguring moment. We might say that in that moment, Elijah is still Elijah, but he's not the same Elijah anymore. And Elisha is still Elisha, but he's not the same. They have both changed. The world has changed. Elijah and Moses, the other figure I mentioned earlier who had his own moment of transfiguration in the biblical narrative, both show up in this morning's gospel story alongside Jesus. This time, the student role is played not by Elisha, but by Peter, where it is Elisha who is insistent and persistent in the story from 2 Kings. In this story, it is Peter 
who presses his case. Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. It is as if practical Peter wants to normalize a not-so-normal moment. He and the other two disciples are on top of the mountain with Jesus. Jesus has been transfigured. He's surrounded by this dazzling light, white light, and then later covered with a cloud. Jesus is joined by those two other transfigured figures, and Peter wants to pitch tents. That's what he says in verse 5 anyway. But verse 6 takes the story in an interesting direction, at least Mark's version. It says, he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Isn't that such a human thing to do, what Peter does? You don't know what to say, so you blurt something out. You're so scared that you say the first thing that occurs to your mind. May not be a good plan, but at least you have something to offer in the moment. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. It's a reminder, at the very least, that that which is dazzling, that which is changed before our eyes, that which is brighter than bright and unexpected and heretofore unknown and eye-popping, the stuff of whirlwinds and bright lights, isn't just something you slide on past. It tests you. It tests your grip on what is your normal reality. So it stands to reason that that which is transfiguring is also terrifying. No wonder Peter doesn't know what to say. No wonder he blurts out the first thing that comes to mind. When we typically talk about change, we smile a bit and say that we don't mind change. We will deal with it. And usually we're thinking about a little bit of change. A little bit here, a little bit there. Things that we will need to do a little bit differently. But if we talk about transfiguration, where the very shape and appearance of reality is transformed, it's another matter. And that's what's happening, is, what's happening here. Reality is transformed. Now, scripturally speaking, what does that mean? What did Jesus' transfiguration mean? Was it some sort of divine magic trick? Glory as attention grabber? No, the presence of Elijah and Moses with Jesus there on the mountaintop would suggest that this was a moment, an event, when Jesus was brought into company with the other great prophets. That he was there to fulfill what they began. If that's true, then transfiguration was not just a light show. It was a moment of prophetic intersection, of transformative confirmation. That is, the seemingly unreal, or at least the surreal, shows up here in the scripture story to confirm a new reality. In that sense, it is an attention-grabbing moment, Jesus becomes dazzling and bright because in his presence there is a new dazzling and bright reality that God is bringing forth. The heavenly voice confirms it. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. What exactly is the new reality? It's a dazzling new way of being. A new and better way of being human as well as living into the image of God. Jesus, shining with God's glory, cloaked with God's approval, launches a new way. This then is a moment that says, prepare to be dazzled, not just by a bright figure on the mountaintop, but by a new and brighter vision for humanity. This is my son, the beloved, listen to him, prepare to be dazzled. This isn't just one bright moment. It's a crossing over to a new vision for humanity. This is my son, listen to him. Jesus brings a new and brighter vision for humankind. What is it? One way to describe it is to call it the way of grace. 
new awareness and new access to the transformative power of love and forgiveness. Another way to speak of it is to simply say that when we do unto others as we would have them do unto us, everything changes. Or we could talk about how God loves us, unconditionally loves us, and how such love draws out of us a positive and life-giving cycle of loving God in return, along with loving neighbor and even loving our enemies. However you want to describe it, this dazzling new reality has the potential and the power to change us, not just superficially, not just externally, but to change us from the inside out. This past week, I have received the daily emails I subscribe to from priest and teacher Richard Rohr, and I've been caught up in his messages about what he calls the stories that don't work until he finally comes to one that does. He references a book by Brian McLaren and Gareth Higgins called The Seventh Story, Us, Them, and the End of Violence. In the book, McLaren and Higgins tell a fable about the people, humankind, that is, who choose false story after false story until they finally come to the real story, the story that does work. So there's seven stories. Of the seven stories, the first story is the domination story, that to be happy is to rule over others, to dominate others. But when that happens, those who are ruled over don't like it. So there's a second story, the story of overthrow that is taking up. That's a story of revolution. But that too is unsatisfying because it just oppresses other people. So some want out of the cycle and see withdrawal as the answer, the story of isolation. And withdrawal, of course, creates distance that inevitably leads to judgment and a fourth narrative form, the story of purification. Purification may satisfy our need to view ourselves as better than others, but it does not fulfill our yearnings to be full and satisfied. And so there's another story, a fifth story, the story of accumulation, which comes about when people try to convince themselves that they deserve things and having more things will make them happy. But when everyone is oriented toward acquisition, not everyone can have everything. So the sixth story is the story of how others get things but we don't, story of victimization. After outlining all of those normal stories according to the world, but unsatisfying stories, which McLaren and Higgins tell in fable form, Rohr says this, then something new. A poet come, came to town, a storyteller, who knew that the domination story, the revolution story, the isolation story, the purification story, the accumulation story, and the victimization story were all destined to fail. They were destined to fail because they invited every human being who is already interdependent with every other human being and even with the earth itself to pretend instead that we are in a competition. The poet had a radical idea, the seed of a seventh story that will heal the world. In the seventh story, the story of reconciliation, we still get to win, just not at anybody else's expense. In the seventh story, the story of reconciliation, Human beings are not the protagonists of the world. Love is. Yes, what a radical idea. What a radically transformative idea. What a dazzling idea that at our core, we don't need to be in competition, that our interdependence is our true identity, that there really is such a thing as win-win, or maybe even win, 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 win. 
that we are not the protagonists in the human story. That is, that we are not the main characters in the human story, even our own human story. Rather, love is. Love is the protagonist. Love is the main character. Now, that might not sound like a radical idea to you, but it is radical. It is radical because to view the world through a lens of win-win, to remove ourselves as the main characters in the human story, to shift from a commitment to competition to an acceptance of interdependence, to follow and trust a pathway of reconciliation is something that is shocking to this world. It is shocking, but I would even say it is dazzling. It could be a change that rather than diminishing humankind, diminishing our control, our power, our safety, instead releases us, releases us to wonder, to healing, to connection. You are quite aware that I'm in the process of moving houses, selling one and buying another. In that process, the real estate agents do everything they can to keep the buyer and the seller apart. They act as the go-between. They do the communicating when there is negotiation going on. The idea is to keep the transaction from becoming personal. And for the most part, it makes sense. Who would want to know what prospective buyers really think about your decor or your style or how clean or dirty your house is? I have a ring doorbell. You know what those are? The audio and video? So I actually have caught some snippets of conversation as prospective buyers have come in and out of our house when we weren't there. It wasn't enjoyable to hear a prospective buyer, for example, a kind of sneer when he heard how old the roof is. But the other side of it is this. The system, like many systems in our world, is set up to be adversarial. One party always wants the other party to concede something. The other party wants the first party to stop being so picky and demanding. If your real estate agent is a skillful communicator, then maybe the feeling of being in competition diminishes somewhat as the focus is kept on getting the deal done. But nevertheless, it's still painted as a win-lose situation, competition rather than interdependence. I've wondered a couple times if the people who want to buy my house actually knew something about me and how much the house has meant to me and to my family and why we did some things to improve it and not others and what plans and dreams I still had for it, what my next thing would be, whether that would change anything about the tone of the transaction. What if they knew that I'd be happy to answer any questions in the future they might have about living at the lake, about the neighborhood, about the particular geography or the culture of that place? What if we were linked by the transaction rather than separated by it? Would the whole thing feel different? Would we all see ourselves as connected in a way that is mutually beneficial? Now, is that a radical idea, a transformative idea, or is it silliness? Because that's not the way the world works. Where there's ownership and money and bank loans and agents involved, there's no interdependence, there's only competition. But let's recognize this. If we don't have the opportunity to connect, to fashion something that is kind and good and mutually beneficial, how do we change the world? How are we changed? How is love moved 
from the sideline to the center. I think the good news of connection and forgiveness, of grace and hope, of kindness and love, holds within it the power of transformation. We can be changed for the better. We can be agents of change for the better. For this is the way of Jesus, the dazzling way of Jesus. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 323, Beyond a Dying Sun, and I'd invite you to stand as you are able. We are made for interdependence, not competition. We are not the protagonists. Love is. We have hope for a better world, a world of grace and restoration. We can be agents of change in the example of Jesus. Let us dazzle the world with change 
for the better. Amen.